Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let's talk about the death ceiling first. You, yeah. talk, you talked about the uh, your piece uh, call, in, for the Globe calling the Republic, Republican con on the debt ceiling. That was the headline. What do you mean? Well, let's start with the fact that the Republicans really don't care about the national debt. And talk about all the evidence that lines that up. First of all, we wouldn't be having a so-called debt ceiling crisis, that is, need to raise the debt, if it hadn't been for just two things. If the Republicans had not jammed through the Donald Trump tax cuts that went mostly to the billionaires and the giant corporations, and secondly, if they hadn't hollowed out the IRS, so the odds of a multimillionaire or billionaire being audited were cut by half. Just those two things alone, if those hadn't happened, we wouldn't hit the debt ceiling until after Joe Biden's first term. So this has been manufactured by the Republicans. But here's the deal. They are saying, yeah, yeah, we really care about the debt ceiling. So what's the very first thing they pass? Take money away from the IRS, which means it's going to increase the national debt. And then they say, we have such a plan. They want to put a 30% national sales tax in place on everything from rent to groceries to diapers to car repairs and give a massive tax cut to the richest people in this country. That's not serious about trying to reduce the national debt. You know, uh, Senator, I, I, when I watch, uh, well, on C-SPAN or whatever, they're, a, let me be as polite as I can, they're a bunch of dopes uh, in Congress. <laughs> and I am not, I know I'm serious, I am not convinced that a lot of the Republicans, the Boberts, the Taylor Greens, even know that this is money that Congress voted already to spend. Right. I mean, that's not, I'm right, am I not? You are totally right. No, not just about the concept, but that they don't get it. Well, they don't get it, and here's the interesting question. They don't get it because they can't get it, or they don't get it because they don't want to get mm. it. You know, these are people who came into Congress, and they got one goal in mind in this two-year period, and that is plow the ground so Donald Trump can get reelected. Right? Want to bring Donald Trump back. That's their, And they made this very clear. And they embrace the chaos because they think that's going to be the best path for Donald Trump. And you know who's told them that's the best path? Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. <laughs> no, it's true. Donald Trump has already said, we've got the stuff on it where he says, you know why the red wave didn't occur, according to Donald Trump? The American people weren't feeling enough pain. But we're going to fix that between now and 2024. You know, so Senator, I don't, I, I don't mean this to sound accusatory. I don't understand what's, maybe you have, why someone like you doesn't lead a charge to just get rid of the damn thing. Oh, why do we even I'm have there, this baby. discussion? I am there. You're referring to me yes. with that comment? I want to yeah, be clear. Thank you. Yes, okay, fine. yes. Thank I you. am totally there. Of course we should get rid of the debt ceiling. And there are 58 different ways you could do it. You just repeal the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Or you could say... Whenever you authorize spending, which is what we've done, you're committed to spend, exactly. you are automatically changing the debt ceiling for whatever it takes to accommodate that. Is, is President Biden correct when he says he's refuses, going to refuse to negotiate about this, talk about this? Well, the way I see it is he's saying, guys, put on the table what you want. Show us where your cuts are. Show us how you're planning to lay out this economy going forward, which, of course, Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans can't do because their only answer is right back where Jim was. Chaos, chaos, chaos. The idea that we're going to go in and start talking about cuts to Social Security, cuts to Medicare, cuts to things that matter to middle class families, working families across this country at a time when the Republicans are just bent on protecting tax breaks for the richest and the most powerful, that's a non-starter. We're talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren, sadly, in Brighton. We're glad she's here in Brighton, but we next time we'll be at the library. You know, Senator, there was a great piece in the Washington Post that described the White House as a Warren-infused White House <laughs> in terms of a lot of the policies you championed, both as a senator and a presidential candidate. One of the ones you had a plan for, you may have heard that expression, was about child care, which is a nightmare everywhere, including here in Massachusetts, despite the best efforts, or at least some efforts on the part of uh, Beacon Hill. Can you remind people what your plan was and tell us what are the prospects for doing anything on this okay. in the foreseeable future? So 
We need childcare all across this country. And we just got to start with the fact that the economics of the system don't work. This is not like going out to buy shoes or going out to buy food. This is a situation where families who need child care can't afford to pay more. They just can't. They're already stretched to the edges. Child care is beyond the means of a lot of people who would like to work. And so watch what happens to the economics. They don't work. They stay out of the workforce. And what does that mean? That means much more pressure. Small businesses, I meet with small businesses right here, and they say, I need more workers. What's the number one thing that would help you get more workers? Child care. If I could get more parents, usually mamas, in here, it would work. But here's the other half of that. Child care workers are paid yeah. so far below, not just the responsibilities they take on, it's just not enough to live on. So you end up with a, a situation, even before the pandemic, you were getting a 30% turnover in child care workers, people who want to work in child care, but they're going to make more money working at the gas station three blocks down from the child care center, and so they leave in order to try to support their families. The only way we're going to make this work is to actually put money into it and help build out those child care centers all across the country. We need safe, affordable, available child care for every family. And we're going to get that when we actually spend the money to make it. And you, went, you had a cap uh, yep. of, of X percent, 7%, so, 7%. Or something on the amount that could be spent mm -hmm. on child care. You know, yep. it, it, uh, the amount that a family could family, spend on child, yeah. child care. What's really frustrating to me, and I'm sure to you, is that this situation for child care hasn't changed much since you had children and I had children. My oldest daughter's 37. This is a long time ago. Uh, we, we're getting almost nowhere, it seems. Talk about the, how far behind we are the rest of the world. So, Marjorie, that's the part that really gets me. I've told this story before, and I'm, I won't tell it again here. But I almost fell off the track by not going back to school because I couldn't get child care, and then uh, quitting my first full-time teaching job, something that was really hard to get. And, you know, look, maybe someday I would have gone back, but I think about the fact, how many women in my circumstances got knocked off the track and never got back on? And it affects them all the way through the years to their retirement, because they have less money in retirement, right. because they couldn't do the work they wanted to do, they trained to do. But here's what gets me. Same thing's true for my daughter. And now the same thing is becoming true for my granddaughter. My, and as a nation, we are now 35 of the 37th richest countries. We are number 35. Yay, we're number 35 in terms of what we spend on our children, on our babies. And you don't build a future as a nation by underinvesting in your very best resource, that is, underinvesting in your own children. And by the way, I, I, the, the naive question I ask almost every time I see it, even though the Republicans don't want to spend money, is there one constituent that a Republican has who would not like to see more affordable? I'm, I'm serious. I just, I, you know, I, I really, I don't get it. I understand the philosophy, if there is one. I don't understand the real world lack of pressure on these people to do something. But you know, Jim, what you're really identifying is, is child care is one of these. But there are multiple yeah. places of uh, corporate taxation where kind of the whole country gets it. Uh, uh, the Stock Act, uh, uh, people in Congress should not be trading in stocks while they're making laws. There are these whole areas where you just can't get something through a Congress where Republicans are saying no, 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 no. And, and yet they're very popular. I, I, I'm, I make the argument often, a progressive agenda is America's agenda. It's things that are popular around the country. They're just not very popular. He says that almost every day. The woman standing to your right. Yeah, the yeah. Americans are on the side of things like yeah. child care and and, and yeah, and more affordable and college and debt relief. Court on the wrong and, yeah, side Supreme, yeah. Court, Supreme Court, abortion. Now we have a, a little task for you. You okay. can you've told other people you're running for re-election, but you can only tell our listeners you're running for re-election if you do what Mike Lee does and use pathetic lyrics from Taylor Swift. So 
don't know. <laughs> I'll say it. Can you do that or I, can no, you not? No, you cannot. I, I can't. But you are running for re-election. But I am running for okay, re-election. Fine, okay. <laughs> hey, Taylor Swift, what do you think should happen with Ticketmaster and Live Nation? Whoa! So for openers... Oh, okay. I love this stuff. Come on, I'm a nerd. Don't laugh at me. For openers... This is a reminder of what it means not to enforce antitrust laws, competition laws, for 40 years now. And I'm saying Democrat and Republican administrations, both, have just kind of given a free pass in one industry after another for the big boys to get together. The most recent of that was Live Nation and Ticketmaster. And here's the thing. They make it through the antitrust hurdles by promising, promising, promising. Oh, they're going to lower costs, and they're going to give more accessibility. They're going to have all these marvelous efficiencies. And then, of course, you see what happens. Because when you've got a monopoly like they do, or a near monopoly like they do, they're able to offer terrible service at high prices. So I think this starts by the federal government actually has the power to do this. Going back and looking at that last merger, and at least let's do a careful application of the law and see if it might be appropriate to break them up. Yeah. You missed an opportunity to say, and if they did that, uh, things would be all too well. You know, uh, <laughs> we're talking to Senator Elizabeth Warren. Senator, uh, affordability is a huge thing with you all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Wu is uh, in the midst of compiling a proposal that she pledged on her uh, and during her campaign to put a local option rent stabilization mm -hmm. measure uh, before the legislature. Which for people, I think it's fairly obvious, individual communities should have passed and be signed by Governor Healy. Individual communities could opt in, could opt out. Do you support that? Yeah. Look, we're in an emergency situation. I, I wish, uh, let's start this way. Our problem is we've got a supply problem. We just don't have enough housing. We don't have enough housing in the greater Boston area. We don't have enough housing in central Mass. We don't have enough housing in western Mass. We don't have enough housing across this nation. Best estimate is we need about 7 million more housing units. And when I talk about housing, I mean across the board. I mean housing for first-time home buyers, young people who are getting started. I mean housing for veterans. I mean housing for seniors who need a different kind of housing than the kind they've had for the last 35 years. I mean housing for people who literally are living on the streets right now. We need more housing. And Developers yeah. say uh, more housing is not going to happen if rent control or rent stabilization is to happen. You appear to think they're yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why are they wrong? <laughs> well, look. Right now, we're not getting enough housing. There are a lot of ways, and I, I get it. We need developers to help build. This is not simply somehow this stuff is going to happen because you water it. You know, it's we need developers to help make this happen. But there are a lot of things that are affecting development. So, for example, zoning laws, um, building codes, uh, building codes that differ from Brighton to Cambridge to Medford, which just drives up the cost of getting a plumber anywhere. So there are a lot of pieces, uh, auxiliary dwelling units uh, out on the Cape. You put a little money on the table. This is something I'm working on really hard right now. And you get more people who say, you know, maybe we'll go ahead and build above the garage and then we'll have something for year round, people who want to live out on the Cape, uh, something more for people who work out there. It, I, I think of it this way, Jim, there is no single mm -hmm. answer to how we're going to get 7 million more housing units, but you've got to push in that direction. But in the meantime, you've got to offer some relief to families who are just getting crushed. We're talking to Elizabeth Warren out here in Brighton. You know, Senator, uh, you talked about uh, in states that have outlawed or practically outlawed abortions, mm -hmm. having abortions available in, in VA hospitals. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that still a live proposal or what's going on with that? Oh, we're in. <laughs> So you are right, Marjorie. This is something I raised as soon as the, the decision came down in Dobbs, that the VA is, as a legal responsibility and authority, to provide the full range of health care services to veterans. So I called the head of the VA and said, you got to step up here. And I get it that you hadn't. I'm not I, I don't want to point fingers about where it's been in the past. It's what's happening now. And the VA has announced that they are changing their policy and they are offering abortion services to veterans who need it.
Wow. Yeah. So, Elizabeth Warren, uh, to every time I look at you, I think I have a plan. So, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, you said it about 10,000 times, hey, so it worked. I got the it. Plans, but plans are good. Okay, when this Supreme Court kills affirmative action, which I assume it will in June, and when this Supreme Court, uh, uh, in my opinion, likely figures out a way to undo the student loan forgiveness that people like you and Congresswoman Presley impressed on the president and ultimately did it up to a cap of $20,000, What's the plan B on either front to get relief to borrowers who are drowning in student debt and to ensure that there's some diversity in higher education? Actually, you know, you're right, and these two are going to link to each other. Uh, let me just start by saying, if the Supreme Court applies the law as it is written, then debt cancellation will go through. Uh, I don't have any doubt about that. The problem now is I'm worried about a Supreme Court that is playing mm -hmm. politics instead of law. So, what are we going to be able to do instead? And the answer is, I want to say more than anything else, we're not giving up on this. Uh, we still have a legislature, we still have other tools at the administrative level, but now is not the time to talk about Plan B, because now is the time to keep banging on the Supreme Court and say, apply the law as it is written. Yeah, but we're going to, you know, one of the things, even when I hear people like you with a, a unbridled optimism about what Congress can do if the people rise up and if you and your colleagues have the will, uh, this Supreme Court is a young Supreme Court and its right wing nature is, is embodied in 52 year olds, 53 year olds who could be there for, I don't know, 30 years. I was so, thinking 111 years. Well, whatever but, you know, it is. It's what it's going to feel like. So, yeah. uh, realistically, I mean, Nancy Gardner is going to join us at noon. She and Tribe were on the presidential commission. They went in believing in term limits. They came out believing in expansion of the court. When are the Democrats going to take a lead on doing something to create greater balance in a right-leaning, and that's being euphemistic, Supreme Court? So, I'm there on expanding the court. And, and, for exactly the reason you identify. I Look, I'm, I'm a law professor, or was, and taught law for a long time, so you talk about something like changing the makeup of the United States Supreme Court in some way other than people die and other people come on, and it just it frizzles my eyelashes. I'm like, ah! And yet, when you've got a court that has now been taken over by this kind of right-wing, out-of-touch, extremist political agenda and that they are aggregating power to themselves. You know, courts, this was always about the, the three parts of government. The big constraint on courts is courts just, you know, bring me the case and I will make the narrowest decision and I will try to be bound by stare decisis. This court is just hauling off and we see Dobbs because that one is very visible, but God, they've gutted unions. They're doing everything they can just to take away the power of unions to be able to organize. They're doing everything they can, as you say, giving every signal that affirmative action is going to be out the door. But you know, realistically, so, if there was a vote on the Senate floor today, even with 51 Democrats, would you have 30 votes if, if that? You know, Jim, you don't have any votes if you don't start talking about it, fighting for it, explaining it. You've got to socialize this stuff. Hey, can I give you an example of mm -hmm. that? So, you and I might have talked back during when I was running for president. One of the things, I had a lot of plans I wanted to do, but you may remember, I paid for every one of those plans. And one of the things I talked about as a pay for was a 15% corporate minimum mm -hmm. tax on these giant corporations. Amazon was reported $11 billion in profits on their book profits and then turned around and paid zero in taxes. They pay less than... Patty's Bar and Grill, right? It, 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 this is wrong, right? Wrong. So I said 15% corporate minimum tax. I cannot tell you the number of people who said to me, oh, get real here, Senator. Nobody is going to go for that. That is so far out. And yet, you keep talking about it. You keep fighting for it. You show it to a bunch of people. I showed it to Angus King, among others. Angus said, you know, that makes real sense to me. Angus and I start talking to more people in the Senate. And then last summer, when the negotiations were occurring for what became the Inflation Reduction Act, there was the part over pharmaceuticals. There's that huge part, our biggest effort ever on climate change initiatives, about $350 billion paid for 100% by a 15%
moved from something nobody could even envision to the center of the Democratic Party. We all voted for it, made it happen. Talk to Elizabeth Warren. You know, speaking of uh, you're having run for president, should Joe Biden run again for president? He'll be 86 by the time his second term is over. If he yes, needs. he should run again. Why? And he is running again because he has gotten a tremendous amount done. It's been two years he's had the skinniest possible majority in the United States Senate and only a very small majority in the House. And yet, look at what we've done. I, I'll pick one that I just love. Besides the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the first time we've raised corporate taxes in 30 years, we also got the biggest climate package we've ever gotten. Uh, it goes into effect right now, the $35 cap for seniors on insulin. Think about these things. Seniors are not going to have to spend more than $2,000 a year on, pharmac on prescription drugs. But look at the other, the CHIPS, this is how I love to say this, Bill, the CHIPS and science Bill, this, when I ran for Senate a decade ago, I said one of the things I think we need to do as a nation, we need to double our investment in science. That is exactly what we did last summer, and Joe Biden signed that into law. He showed he's willing to wade into the fights. He waded into the fight on student loan debt if he's, for 43 million Americans. If he's that old in a second term, the vice presidency becomes even more important. Mm -hmm. Should Kamala Harris be the, his choice the second time around? You know, I, I really want to defer to what makes Biden comfortable on his team. I've known Kamala for a long time. I like Kamala. I knew her back when she was when she was an attorney general and I was still uh, uh, teaching and we worked on the housing crisis together. So we go way back, but they need they have to be a team, and my sense is they are. I don't mean that by suggesting I think there are any problems. I think they are. Before you go, speaking of waiting in, you waited in a couple of days ago in the Democratic primary to replace uh, yeah. Diane Feinstein, Katie Porter. And uh, there is a Democrat, the only Democrat as far as I know, who announced that uh, he is running for the United States Senate seat uh, uh, in Arizona. Uh, now that Kirsten Cinema is an independent, will you support the Democrat? Um, it's early now to be talking about what we're going to do in that race. Kirsten Sinema hadn't even said whether or not she's running. So I think we need to let that one play out a little bit more. I do want to say about... Oh, wait, but would you ever uh, imagine endorsing an independent over a Democratic nominee? Uh, you'd have to explain to me the circumstances that would okay. make that happen. Okay. Um, I want to say, though, about Katie Porter. <laughs> I've I've known Katie Porter for over 20 years now. Uh, she was my student. I can describe her oh, first day in that. class. Oh, man. Are you? She, well, <clears throat> there are a lot of stories I can tell you about Katie. But she also ended up working on my bankruptcy project, ultimately. Eventually, she became, as you know, a law professor herself, mm -hmm. wrote books in bankruptcy, did a lot of the studies. Um, she's someone who fights from the heart. And she came to me in 2016. Uh, after Donald Trump was elected, and she said, I can't do this. I can't sit on side and just keep writing the articles. And she said, I'm going to run for Congress. And I said, from where? <laughs> and she said, well, Orange <laughs> County. And I said, I, I don't know California politics, Katie, but it, it, haven't they, like, voted Republicans since you know, the earth was created or something, and Katie said, yeah, I'm running in a district that literally has never elected a Democrat. And I said, so what's your plan? And she said, because that's always my question, she started ticking off the things that matter to people. And she said, I'll fight this fight. She said, will you, if you'll fight alongside me? And I said, count me in, and by golly, she's won three times in a row in a red district by fighting for the things she believes in. And to me, that's the kind of thing we gotta we gotta stay behind. We gotta support that. So sorry.com you can send her five bucks. Well, okay. <laughs> sorry we didn't see you at the library. We'll make it up to you next time. And to people who were there to see you today, Senator Warren. Thanks so much for your time.